All right, we are live. This is the Synth Summit Show, episode 34. And I have with me today uh, Gary Chang, who I am very excited to talk to as he's got a, a wonderful history that he can discuss with us and uh, just a wealth of knowledge. Gary, um, I'm not going to I'm not going to dive too, too deep into your um, discography right away, just because we'll be here all day if I do that. <laughs> but uh just really some some legendary film scores uh, through the 80s and 90s and 2000s as well. Um, and uh, yeah, h- how are you? <laughs> I'm good, thanks. Uh, the first thing I wanted to, to get into you uh, into with you is we're going to start kind of more towards the beginning. And uh, can we can we talk about how you started uh, really back at school? We'll go all the way back to the school years first and who you were um, dealing with in school and and that sort of thing. Okay. Well, I mean, my roots with electronic music is pretty strange. I, uh, when I was a freshman in college, I was attending Tufts university in Boston, Massachusetts. And I'll be really honest. I hated it. I just really couldn't stand it. So during the winter break, I auditioned um, to Carnegie Mellon University and I got accepted and I was, uh, and I planned to transfer to Carnegie Mellon that following fall. So I had a spring semester at Tufts in Boston that I had really nothing to do. So I took, you know, modern dance and conducting and, you know, piano lessons. And um, I was playing the piano one day in the lounge and uh, a gentleman was in there and he listened and uh, we struck up a conversation. And uh, at some point in the conversation, I told him, you know, I'm, I'm leaving Boston this spring. And I, you know, he said, why? And I said, I, I can't stand it. You know, I honestly, uh, you know, I hate the place because it's just a, a city of screaming children. And every time you, you know, I, I went to see uh, Frank Zappa at Symphony Hall and you couldn't hear the music for all the kids in the audience screaming. So he said, you know, what are you doing Friday? And I said, oh, well, I'm doing nothing. He's, well, let me take you out to dinner, man, and show you my Boston. So I went with him and uh, we had a wonderful dinner. And then we walked up Boylston Street to the jazz workshop. And <clears throat> in the jazz workshop, that evening was the Herbie Hancock sextet. And there's Herbie with his Rhodes and an Echoplex and Wawa and all sorts of different things in there. And, uh, you know, the, the whole experience blew my mind because first of all, it was a culture, the whole audience part of the experience was so respectful and so incredibly into the music. I mean, this was, lifeblood to them. It was like going to church or something, you know? And uh, so, you know, after that, basically, after that evening, I said, you know, okay, you blew my mind. Thanks very much. You know, you know, the reality, though, is for me to get in there, he had to actually give me his Massachusetts driver's license because the drinking age at the time was 21 and I was 18. So I got in there illegally and, you know, when I got out of there, I gave him, handed his uh, driver's license back and I said, thank you so much for the special, you know, experience. And he said, oh, no, no, just keep the license, you know, use it. So for the rest of that semester, I saw Miles Davis. I saw, you know, probably 30 sets of Miles Davis that spring. I saw uh, Weather Report. I saw Herbie again, um, you know, Return to Forever. I, I totally changed my um, idea about what professional music was. You know, no longer was it just classical music or rock and roll, but here's this other side, this middle section where there's some really smart people here. They're experimenting with electronic music. And for a long time, that genre of music completely drove my interest and um so dot 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 i went through carnegie mellon university and at carnegie mellon 
in the spring of the first year I was there, Paul Dvorak, who teaches, you know, is a professor emeritus at North Texas State at this point, um, he came in, he was a PhD student at Carnegie Mellon, and he said, hey, look, we just uh, won a grant from, um, you know, for artificial intelligence that so far up to this point only MIT and Stanford has had. So the first thing that the computer science department did at Carnegie Mellon was they bought the Bell Laboratories library and in it is music software. So is there anyone that's interested? And I raised my hand and one other person raised their hand. And for the next several, you know, for the rest of the time I was at Carnegie Mellon, the three of us basically were given, you know, uh, a ton of computer time and we hung out in the computer center and we learned computer music. Uh, you know, it was at a time when all the teachers said, you know, you're, you're an idiot to think that you should, this means anything or it's going to go anywhere. You know, little do they know what happened. So um, after Carnegie Mellon, I went to Carnegie, I went to California Institute of the Arts and I studied with Mort Subodnik. And there, you know, I was in electronic music studios with uh, 10 oscillator Buchla systems. And, uh, you know, Serge, or, you know, I met Serge Trepnin at the time. Um, it was an incredible time at CalArts. Uh, this, the academic, full academic year, I was there for three semesters and got my master's degree. But the full year that I was there, um, Visiting composers were John Cage, Morton Feldman, Elliot Carter, Charles Warren, and Jacob Druckmann. I mean, like the who's who of American music in the 20th century, you know, the post-war 20th century, were our visiting composers. It was an amazing experience. So, you know, it's like I went from, you know, this incredible new jazz thing to 20th century contemporary music and I get out of school it's like I would you know I'm I studied with uh, the greats I came down from the mountain to Hollywood and uh, looked for you know couldn't afford to really move back east I grew up in Pittsburgh uh, so I was kind of stuck in Los Angeles so I I basically tried to figure out how to make a living here. And uh, I ultimately, my connection to the whole situation, you know, I played in bands. I did a, a few R&B, uh, you know, sessions, stuff like that. But <clears throat> I eventually got the gig when the Fairlight computer music instrument came to town. Uh, I got the gig as a product specialist because there were very few people who had, you know, computer music background at the time. So um, from the Fairlight gig, I basically met everyone who I eventually worked with uh, in the, in, you know, in Los Angeles. Um, eventually, you know, I worked with, uh, well, I actually got to work with Herbie and Chick and Joe uh, in the 80s. That had to be a bit of a mind work to go from from watching those guys to, to working with them directly. Uh, I loved it. It helped it helped completely you know finish the circle about my fascination, initial fascination with new music and I mean you know I have to say like early fusion in 70, 71, was some of the coolest music I think ever made on the planet. And, I, I agree. <laughs> you know, and th those guys were will always be heroes wherever they are. God bless, God bless them. And uh, you know, it generated a different uh, attitude—the attitude that I could actually make a living doing something that fascinated. You know, I <laughs> mean, meet, meet these guys. Well, let me ask you, when you started, when you started working with these guys and you were already pretty grounded in um, kind of cutting edge electronic music and, and um, 
you know, really experimental stuff, music concrete, that sort of thing. Um, how did uh, the melding of, of those two worlds work out for you? Because, you know, these guys were, were doing a lot of this fusion and, and experimental work and you were coming from, you know, literally being under Sabotnik and, and these, you know, John Cage and these other guys that were really kind of pushing the envelope in, in some less traditional boundaries. Um, did that kind of tend to fuse into your work with them? Well, I think, um, you know, the thing that that's interesting is to understand in retrospect, you know, of course, it's easier to, to recognize what it is, but like Sabotnik was one of the first guys who did everything himself, right? He wasn't, oh, he didn't just write the notes. He wasn't just the composer. He also was the, the performer. He patched the, the synthesizer. He created the sounds. He wasn't just the performer. He was the engineer. He hooked up the tape recorder. He, you know, he, he got the, the record plant remote truck out to the house and did his tracks. And then he mixed his stuff. He did everything himself. So, you know, when I first started doing sessions in L.A., it was quite a contrast, right? Because you, you walked in, it's like, oh, I need to patch into the reverb. No, oh, no, no. The engineer is like, oh, that's my domain. You know, there's a guy operating the tape machine. Um, you know, you sit over here. You're just the talent. You're just going to make the noise and then we'll deal with all the rest of the stuff, right? And um, it's interesting because, see, jazz was never... The, those guys never thought of it that way because, you know, let's face it, it's like they love this idea of like, I'll take a bunch of electronic music instruments and I'm just going to close my eyes and make a noise and then we'll go from there. And they were smart enough to be able to create music this way. And I always just admired the hell out of that. You know, I just really respected. They weren't t-shirt makers, you know, they weren't sitting there going, I need to make a new single and here's the form and this is how I'm going to fill the slots in this time. No, they were just really wildly adventurous people. Okay. So how I come into their, their situation is, you know, I, I'm bringing, you know, a guy like Herbie is coming from record sessions and all that kind of stuff. And I'm bringing Sabotnik in, you know, I'm bringing in, oh, well, what if we, you know, what, what if we loop this in or, you know, and at the time, you know, hardware wise, when I got involved with those guys, not only was I the product specialist at Fairlight, but, you know, at the time I also had a CS80 and it was modified for my surge. Um, I, you know, my very first synthesizer was, an, uh, you know, first a six panel surge that I built in 1976, the summer of 1976. And um, at that time, uh, Serge was in Hollywood and um, he was, you know, doing some work for uh, um, Malcolm Cecil. Uh, and one of the people who was working with Malcolm at the time was uh, Kevin Brahini, who you know is a longtime associate and uh, friend of Serge's. Um, and I met. Malcolm, you know, I met Malcolm at that time, but I also met Kevin at the time, and Kevin and I grew to be very good friends at, at that time. Um, so I built this modular stuff. I got a National Endowment grant in 1976, which helped me add a couple more panels to my surge. So I had an eight-panel surge. I had a CS80. And so, you know, the ideas of how to incorporate modular things into uh, music was something that I could add and the computer, of course. 
Well, let me let me ask real quick. So you mentioned that you had the CS80 and the Surge, um, and you modified the the CS80. What brought that modification about? Because that's not. I mean, we're not talking about pennies here, you know, like that's that's a pretty ambitious thing to do to a CS80. And this is back when CS80s were new. Uh, It's that's another wild story. Right. So, like, I'm broke in in, um, Los Angeles living at um, Serge's lab, which is above a massage parlor at the corner of Western and Santa Monica in Hollywood. I'm sitting there going, you know, and I just got fired by Surge. <laughs> so I'm sitting there going, okay, I have to figure out what's next. I have to find a job. So I bought the Sunday Times and I looked at the classifieds and found the only thing I could really do is, oh, look, there's a job at the Pointy Hills Mall selling organs at Organ Exchange. So I went out there and, uh, you know, unbelievably, they hired me, even though my hair was like, this long, oh, so you got to cut your hair, you got to wear different clothes, blah, blah, blah. So I show up at work there and uh, I ultimately meet a guy who has moved here from Texas who had just won the American Songwriters competition that year, which was that, you know, he got a check for $25,000, which at the time was a considerable amount of money. Uh, moved to California to become, you know, the next Glenn, Glenn Campbell. And uh, so ultimately I knew how to produce music at the time. So he basically, and I made a deal. Um, I'll produce five songs for you. And in exchange, what you're going to do is you're going to co-sign a loan for me to buy the, a CS80. So, Ultimately, that's what happened. I mean, it was a real struggle for me to pay off the, the monthly payments, to pay monthly payments at the time, but I did. But um, the, the store I bought it from, ABC Music in Burbank, had a great tech who um, I asked him about the idea, you know, is it possible? Can I get trigger inputs? Can I get CD inputs? Because I want, I have this modular, you know, that's that was my background really was modular synthesizers is kind of this is all pre drum machines and whatnot so um, ultimately that's w- how that happened you know and was they, this uh, something that they had done before at all no because I would think not no I mean you know the thing about it that's funny about electronics at the time you know, this is the late 70s. So what's going on is people don't like transformers anymore. They're yanking transformers out of mixing consoles, right? Um, but they're using, you know, op amps as buffers for for everything. So like, you know, it was fairly simple for them, you know, to put a, a floating board inside the CSA to, uh, that basically were just buffer amps yeah, and find patch points, audio patch points or control voltage patch points in and out. Right. And I could use the processors, uh, scaling processors in my surge to basically control it. Right. So, uh, so you could actually control it as well. It wasn't just voice outputs, but you could actually control it. That's right, man. <laughs> it's it was, awesome. it, it was a lot of it was a lot of fun, but you know, at the same time, it was. Look, you know, at a certain point in time in your life, you just grow too old to have custom gear. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's sort of like, oh, I love this, except you know, when it breaks, I have to deal with it. I have to go, you know. So I mean, but I only own I own the CS80 for um, three years, I guess, you know, and. Uh, uh, I love the instrument and it was a fantastic thing, but I eventually sold it and bought a, uh, a Jupiter 8. And uh, that Jupiter 8 is the Jupiter 8 that you you found, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, that's, yeah, that was that was kind of a, a strange thing because, you know, I was, I'm helping out on a project and, and the 
we've been doing everything we could to avoid buying <laughs> Jupiter 8. And then, you know, this Jupiter 8 comes up and, uh, yeah, it, it was kind of like, uh, th there was a message of, of, yeah, this, this Jupiter 8, it, it's got some, some weird things going on around back. And, um, there's a name on, on the flight case, something, something Chang, something. And I was like, Gary Chang. And, uh, <laughs> he's like, <laughs> He's like, yeah, I think that's it. I, I I nearly jumped out of my seat when I heard that. <laughs> so I had to hurry up and go straight to Messenger and message you and say, hey, hey, uh, <laughs> can you? What can you tell me about this? <laughs> well, you know the being in the customized, uh, comp you know, electronic music uh, stage that I was in. Uh, I was working at Fairlight, so I was working out of the Village Recorder, and at the Village, they had a huge shop because they had, you know, they were, they had built Studio D for uh, Fleetwood Mac a few years before, and uh, they they were rebuilding a bunch of their rooms. Uh, so there was a, a lot of facility to be able to do the modifications I needed to, and uh, Will Alexander, who uh, had just come to Fairlight from Oberheim, uh, decided, you know, that he could he could help me with this. And basically, he put a plate on the back with a uh, an Elko ninety six pin connector on it, which was enough to basically get give me audio outputs, right? And uh, um, the idea, once again, there's buffers leading from the boards so that you basically don't have any kind of, you know, uh, impedance problem or, you know, push-pull problem between the inputs and the outputs that you're plugging into. Um, We're talking about modifying a Jupiter 8, which at this point, I mean, they had to have, like, just been released, right? That's right. I, I bought my this Jupiter 8 for, Jupiter 8 you bought is one of the very first Jupiter 8s that Roland produced. And I bought it directly from the factory. Can we can we back up just a little bit and explain to me how you got introduced to the Jupiter 8? Oh, okay. Well, I was doing, you know, working for Fairlight as I did all the trade shows. I did uh, the NAMM show, the AES show. Um, I did the computer music conventions um and uh so like i'm hanging around all of the manufacturers for you know the entirety the week of the show and of course you know i met uh a few people at roland corp usa and uh, they were interested in the fairlight i showed them that and they showed me the jupiter 8 and i i thought you know that's interesting you know uh and they said, hey, look, you you just come and visit us and check it out. So I went down to the factory. They gave me a pair of headphones, and I sat in front of the Jupiter 8 for a couple hours, and I realized this is probably the coolest patch of any polyphonic I had ever used. You know, it's like if I wanted to play, you know, uh, gas music from Jupiter, I could do that with this instrument, or I could play sessions with it, <laughs> you know? I mean, uh, it was really a very cool instrument. So ultimately- Did they, did they have to kind of like sell you on the idea of it at all, or were you just all in right away? Um, you know, they, they didn't try to sell me too hard. I mean, at that time, you have to remember, uh, what did Roland do that turned anybody's heads at the time you know it wasn't the sho one no one none of the pros really gave a shit about any of that stuff but their modular stuff and the roland micro composer the mc8 micro composer that was different <laughs> and it was sort of you know uh yeah before i got into the fairlight i was programming somebody else's roland mc8 you know, and uh, why? Oh, well, it's just really a simple piece of hardware that had lists, right? So you just, here's the list of pitches, 
Uh, here's the list of rhythm, you know, timing. Uh, and here, here's the, the, uh, the list of, uh, you know, amplitude, right? And it's all quarter inch patch chords out. You know, ultimately that was the, the interesting thing is uh, eventually uh, the first thing that happened with the Jupiter 8 was uh, an external CV and gate input thing. And so that was it. It's like, here's the Jupiter 8, here's that interface, here's the MC8, perfect. Next thing that happens, Lin drum machine. So now you have Lin drum machine syncing to the, the MC8 and you have your first eight voice, you know, and that's the thing is you could do uh, bass and in the lower half of the Jupiter 8 and you do chords in the right, you have a, your first electronic music rhythm section, right? That's all computer controlled, all programmable. And, uh, you know, ironically, a few years later, uh, when I worked with Giorgio Moroder, Giorgio Moroder's, uh, his pres that current um, songwriting set situation was a Lin drum machine and then the cowbell out plugged into the arpeggiator input mm -hmm. Jupiter 8 and then play trigger bass on the left, you know, play bass in his left hand and play chords in the right hand. You know, Giorgio is quite a, a brilliant guy, man. And, uh, as far as patching and, and... Well, as far as production, let me give you an idea of this. Before drum machines existed, right? <laughs> He went to at Westlake when he after uh, not long after he moved to Los Angeles, he went to Westlake and he got Keith Horsey to come in and he recorded it on two inch tape, one drum at a time. So here's four on the floor is one track and then backbeat is another track, a snare and then uh, various hi hats so like first, you know, quarter quarter note hi-hats and then eighth note hi-hats and then eighth note triplet hi-hats and 16th note hi-hats, right? And then every every uh, two beats, a little thing, every four beats, a little bit bigger uh, fill, every eight beats, even bigger fill, you know, and then fill out the 24 track with percussion, percu you know, uh, tambourine, cowbell, whatever, okay? He does that, and after he's done with that, he takes it to the studio manager and says, can you make me a hundred copies of this? And makes a hundred copies of this drum-filled recording, right? So every day, Giorgio, when he'd go to write, he'd take a fresh copy of the tape into the studio with him, and then basically put it up on the two inch tape machine, unmute the parts that he wanted to get the, and VSO the track down to the tempo he wanted. And he would write like this, a rate, you know, and that, so this is, this is a few years before uh, the Lynn drum machine came out. Uh, yeah, that's what I was gonna say. I was, this, is, this is where Lynn made his money. <laughs> Well, this is, I mean, talk about being industrious. And, you know, that's the thing that's interesting is Sub Subotnik and Giorgio, ironically, what they had in common was they work by themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they learn and generated techniques to work by themselves. And so, you know, pretty, pretty impressive. I was really amazed to see a guy who's doing pop music, you know, figuring this stuff out, right? <laughs> yeah. Not common, right? So. The, um, so, so the, the crux of it was early on, you had the CS80 and you had that modded, um, which is, is wild. Not only did you have it modded just for voice output, but you had, you know, full control voltage and you were using it with a surge, right? Yes. Um, then, you know, you get 
to go see the the early Jupiter Eight, you look at that and you're like, okay, well, this is pretty darn cool. So let me let me show you something real quick, okay? So this is this is my buddy uh, Just Blaze, and there it is, right there. That's the Jupiter Eight. <laughs> hey, Gary. Hey, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good, thank you. I'm sitting here with your baby. <laughs> That's really cool. She's in very good hands, and she's not trading hands again. That's really great. You know, <clears throat> there's both of these, you know, my CS80, I sold in 1981. I sold it to the SOS band, you know. So, like, a lot of my wow have, you know, passed in R&B R and B lines, you know, it's interesting. Right. I love these instruments, though. I'm so happy that you you have it. It's still operating, you know. It's uh, oh, there she works like a charm. There, there might be a, a, a slight tuning issue that I'm gonna take a look at later, but like it's 99 percent there, you know. I just wish it still had your modification with the uh, the voice outputs. Yeah, well, you know, like everything that's had handmade you know right it's like it just doesn't age the way that the machine made stuff does right so it was just a matter of time i mean it's it's a doggone miracle that uh at some point in time someone went okay let's remove that mod right. <laughs> and and put the midi thing in there and you know i'm i'm sure uh that's the problem you know uh, about handmade devices i i love them and everything but um they age you know yes now you well this one is when modded MIDI, like that that midi mod was was something that you had had done right the the midi mod on that one because you had two jupiter eights yes the second jupiter eight had modif midi modification but this jupiter eight um when the dcb bus came out I just went with it. You know, that instrument, okay, what's what's the song I can tell you that instrument played on? Mm -hmm. Obsession. What? Yeah, that's that's me with the Fairlight, Fairlight and uh the Jupiter 8. Wow, the price just went up. I told you, I think. <laughs> that is amazing. I knew, you know, that's the, the one thing when you, when you, you know, when you're buying a uh, vintage gear, you know, you're always curious about its story, its journey, where it's been, what it's been a part of. You know, there's gear of mine that's floating out there that I've used on like, you know, huge, huge records and the seller might have no clue you know, where it's been, what it's seen. I, I actually was the victim of that as well. I once bought an, um, an MPC 60, an MPC 62 back in maybe two, maybe like 1999, 98. Mm -hmm. And I sold it. Uh, we used to have a, in New York, we used to have this one ads newsletter called loot. It was kind of like eBay before eBay or reverb before reverb where people would just list their things for sale. And it circulated throughout the uh, tri-state area. Yes. So I had upgraded to an MPC, probably 2000 at the time, sold it, uh, sold it to a guy. In, I put the MPC 62 in loop. Guy came and picked it up. I sold it for 900 bucks, <coughs> um, which wasn't bad for the time. I think I actually maybe made 100 bucks on the deal. But I found out after I got rid of it, and uh, Ken, you, you'd freak out over this. That was the MPC that was used to sequence half of Slick Rick's out first album. <laughs> and I found out after the fact, I went to the guy that I bought it from. I bought it from, Gary, you might be familiar with a place, I don't know how, how often you frequent New York. Talking like Children's Story? Like, like what are we talking about? Um, it wasn't Children's Story because that was done- Yeah, a little after that, right? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a place that in this, it used to be in the city. It's, it used to be called Doctor Sound, and um, which is now Three Wave in New Jersey. But um, I bought it from a. I, I went back there a few weeks after I sold it. 
And he asked me, hey, do you still have that NPC? I said, no, I actually just sold it. He said, I said, the guy that sold it to me just came in here, and apparently that was used on this record, this record, this record. And I'm like, if I had known that, even if I wasn't going to use the machine anymore, I would have kept it just based on its history. But I had no clue. You know, so it's just it's always a it's always a trip to hear stories like this, and this this actually makes me appreciate that this thing that much more. Well, a lot of these instruments um, that you know, some people are they carry it on tour and they're right. and they're trash, but right. that, that particular instrument that was really a babied instrument. It really was uh, in records. You know, I mean, other records. Uh, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, the best of everything. Um, wow. Um, tr uh, there's just a lot of, there's a lot of stuff. That this thing right. is, but the, the truth is, is all these things that were played in the studios were pretty much baby. Right, they, they were well were, kept. They were well kept and they were well maintained because right. this is how we're, this is our lifeline. This is how we're making a living. You can't show up to the gig and it doesn't work or right. wrong with it, right? So and and also, it was maintained at the Roland factory. Right. <laughs> you know? I could just drive it down to Roland and they would fix it. You know, wow, so, that's amazing. So it's a really it's an interesting thing, you know, because I mean, um, I love well, I love these instruments. Hey, Gary, let me let me ask. Uh, so just a rough like roundabout of time period of like when that would have been serviced at the Rowan factory around like, like what time period are we talking about here? I'm just wondering, cause I'll have to go back to my boss. Cause my boss used to work <laughs> at the Rowan factories. Repair you know, I, mean, I think uh, Jim mother's bar Mark's okay. brother uh, ran the Roland um, service at that time. So it's like 81, 82, Okay. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. The, my, my boss, the, the CEO of ASM, he, he used to work at the, at the Roman factory as well, repairing, uh, repairing like Jupiter sixes and all that stuff. So. Oh, you know, I know who you're, I know who you're talking about. Yes. Glenn. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, yes, we do. And we know each other from, from that too. I think, you know, the thing that's really interesting at the time is, um, man, electronic music on one side of it you know when the dx7 came out a lot of these instruments kind of fell off right i mean a, a lot of the manufacturers fell fell away and it's because at one point in time like the jupiter 8 cost three thousand dollars in 19 you know 81 and it was expensive right i mean but what else cost three thousand dollars an OBXA, you know, a profit. So you're a Chevy. <laughs> right. I mean, you could buy a lot of things for three thousand dollars at the time. Um, so when you could buy a DX7 for like nine hundred dollars, it just the whole economic, uh, you know, floor of the business dropped away, and. Uh, the interest was moving more towards digital than than that anyway. Uh, you know, uh, companies came out with stuff, you know, post the Fairlight, they came out with the emulator and, you know, other types of sample type instruments. Um, so for a while, the, these polys um, didn't get the love that they, I think they deserve. Um, you know, like, of, I, I've probably owned all the polyphonics out there. I haven't owned the Schmidt. <laughs> <laughs> well, whenever you're, whenever you're uh, in the New York area, you're welcome to come by and play. I'd be honored. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. I tell you what, yeah, that's, it, it's kind of beautiful seeing those three synths together like that. Cause uh, those are like three of like the most epic synths of each era. Of each era. Right. Right. That, that's, that Pretty that awesome. was kind of the idea. Like, you know, Ken, you and I were talking about this a few nights ago when I was trying to figure out how to arrange it. And I'm like, do I do old versus new? Or like, have the new stuff here and the old stuff on the other side? But seeing these three together, it was kind of like the height of each era. <laughs> um, I mean, this was obviously 
the King Supreme for many years. Going back to the, towards the early 2000s, you know, the Andromeda was kind of revolutionary for what it did at the time. Yeah. And now you have this monster. You know, so it's kind of like, I just like the way it looked and it was kind of, there's just a story here. So, yeah. you know, it's, it, I, I ended up leaving it, you know, this way. Initially, I just threw the Jupiter right up right here because I wanted to play it and the sip that it was replacing, I never, I was never going to play. You know, so it was easy. But then when I looked at it, I'm like, oh, this is perfect. It tells a story in itself. Do you have that, um, the, the, the patch notes? Yes. Uh, give me one second. I just pulled them out of the studio. Hold on a second. Yeah. So as he's going through stuff, you know, in the flight case, he came across like a manual with patch notes, and we weren't sure if the handwriting on there might be yours. <laughs> I don't know how well you'd be able to see this. Uh... So yeah. it's it's a little hard. I'll have to I'll have to send you a snapshot of it yeah, too. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's 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 instructions on the it's what's called a basic string patch and then a basic French horn. And what's interesting is the reason why I thought it could possibly be yours is because the rest of these patch sheets in here are clearly photocopies. Mm -hmm. uh, this one is like uh, you can just tell from the, the the yellowing of the paper. This one is an original patch sheet. It might not be yours, but it's definitely an original patch sheet. Yeah, I don't, I don't recall um, passing on the JP8 manual when I sold Got it. it. Okay. So it's probably not mine. No. But Got it. worth you know, checking. Yeah, I love uh, That's the interesting thing. I mean, I didn't own an Andromeda. I had a wave, I had a 32 voice wave. Right. That was the other. When I was working at Giorgio's, the, the setup was a Fairlight. Um, PPG 2.3, a pair of DX sevens, the Jupiter eight, and that was and a Lynn drum machine. That was kind right. of the basic core of everything. There were, you know, there was a Sinclair there. There was a whole bunch of other different things that I had available, but that was kind of more or less the stack that I used. And uh, gotcha. eventually, eventually, the Jupiter eight went away for a pair of uh, MKS eighties, which I still have in the rack here that's funny that uh, i have an mks 80 sitting right next to it that was <laughs> that was what was first purchased to avoid yeah. doing that <laughs> right so you know it was I, I i i wasn't prepared to meet the uh the cost of what this was gonna you know you know we, we know what jupiter rates are selling for now yeah and I, I didn't think i was gonna spend that kind of money so i came across an mks 80 in mint condition with the controller and everything or with the programmer and i said you know what it's a fraction of the price I'll get in the ballpark. Let's do it. And um, I actually, just as I started to really scratch the surface of the M uh, of the MPS eighty, I came across a good deal on this one. Um, and I was like, you know what? I, I I could wait it out, but the price was so low, relatively speaking. It was about seven grand under what people are generally asking for them these days. And I said, you know what? That opportunity is probably not, not going to come across again. Right. Yeah, and then um, when you told me the name, I was like, "Hold up!" <laughs> yeah, and then I, I so I hit Ken, and I'm like, "Hey, and it was owned by it was owned by this guy," and I told him about it, and I'm, and I'm like, "I know his work, I know his movies, I don't know the guy personally, I, I I'm not familiar with him personally. Like, I can't rattle off a bunch of your work off the top of my head, but as I started reading the list, I'm like, I've seen that movie, I love this movie, I know this TV show, I know that song, and that's kind of to be honest, the low price, relatively speaking, combined with the fact that there is some clear history." attached to the machine is really just what made it super valuable to me. And I had to go have that conversation with my wife. And I'm like, listen, I know I said, that this, I know that I said that the Schmidt was the last one, but check this out. I found a unicorn. Yeah. You know, and I, I sat with her and she was a little apprehensive at first when I told her the number, but I said, listen, just, we'll talk about it later. So the next, what happened was the next day, um, I was working, when it's the right mood. <laughs> yeah. The, the next day I was working on a piece for a project, the score that I'm doing. And she came down, she just happened to walk in the room and she heard it. She loved it. She was like, play it again. And I played it for her. And um, one of our uh, partners on the project happened to uh, Zoom her um, for a quick conference while she was here with me. So he hears it. And he's like, oh my God, this is amazing, blah, blah, blah. So she, they didn't know what it was for. They didn't know it was for our project. So after she gets off the call, she's like, so what is this for? Or she said, no, so what is this? I said, this is the reason you're buying me that Jupiter 8, or you're letting me buy the Jupiter 8. <laughs> and, and she said, all right. 
I get it. And she walked off, and the next day we made the call, and that was that. So speaking of which, i got to get back to another Zoom for that project now. The team is waiting for me. But I wanted to say thank you. Gary, Gary, it's a pleasure to chat with you. Pleasure to meet you and an honor. Very nice to meet you, too. And uh, live on, on, man. Live on, live on in, uh, you know, enjoy with your music and that Jupiter rate. I'm sure will serve you well. Be thank you very much, man. I hope, I hope it does a quarter of me what it did for you. I'll see you guys later. <laughs> yeah, right. I'll talk to you later on. Peace. <laughs> that's, so, so that's that's just a it's a beautiful thing when you see these 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 synths are living on and you know it's you know constantly and and being kept up at that because it's you know that's the other thing is that when you when you have a synth that's even if it's babied for this long you know like we had talked about uh before you had mentioned about the capacitors and that and whatnot um it, it you know maintaining these things and keeping them in pristine order it's like <clears throat> it's a living museum piece, you know? It is. And, you know, I think that's the, um, why is digital, why is digital, you know, prevalent now? And why is it practical? Part of it is, you know, people don't really understand. It's like, oh, I own a Neve 1073 mic pre. Oh, it's brilliant. Yeah, well, even if it was brand new, after about five years, you're going to start looking at the idea of what what's the condition of the capacitors, you know? <laughs> How yeah. often do you have to recap an analog circuit to keep it sounding the way it does, you know? It's not a simple thing. But, you know, when I recapped my Super Jupiters, it was unbelievable the difference in the sound. It mm -hmm. was just... It was just crazy. It's kind of like were they were they old caps at that point, or were you upgrading them to a higher quality cap at that point? Um, just upgrading them to a current cap, right? Yeah, but you know, it's just the same as the Model D, right? The reissued Model D to uh, a nineteen seventies or nineteen eighties Model D. You know, those of us who own a, a Model D in that era. I can just honestly say every single one of them was modified because they didn't stay in tune. They were really quirky machines. And would I rather have a new Model D? Oh, you're damn right. It has a MIDI keyboard. It's, you know, it's so much more of uh, a precision device than what the originals were, you know? So um, let's let's wind back a little bit more towards the career, and and I gotta ask. So so you were working with Marauder. Uh, what was what was this kind of stuff on? Um, the first session I did was the Never Ending Story. With okay. Georgia. Now, and what were you doing in these sessions? Um, I wrote a couple of cues, and uh, I you know arranged a few, and uh, I just did electronic music overdubs on a couple you know and this stuff um did, was this kind of like where you were cutting your teeth or did you feel already like fully confident to just roll right into the project or wh like where were you at skill wise for those sorts of projects <laughs> at this point well you know i would always say to my students you know how this basically works is like on the first call you come in and like you know He'd say, okay, I have a song and I've arranged it this way. Can you actually realize the, the arrangement? Can you flesh it out and uh, finish it? So you do it and you turn it in and he goes, oh, that sounds great. And The next call, it's sort of, okay, I, I've got a song. It's kind of like the last one I did and it's half done. The arrangement's half done. Can you finish the arrangement and then at the electronics right and so you do it and it he likes it and the next time he calls you okay i have a song like the last two but can you arrange it the way the other one is so you arrange it then the next thing dot 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 you know hey i've got a song like the ones we've been doing can you you know can you can you finish the bridge and uh the arrangement so finally, you know, can you write a song like the ones that we've been doing, right? So that's kind of like the evolution of the co of collaboration, and uh, you know, 
the thing that's really interesting is like Georgia Moroder, uh, everyone looks at him like, well, he's, you know, he's not an expert. And, you know, everyone who's worked for him, we just have to argue with that. You know, <laughs> he, he's really a smart guy. And when I worked for him, you know, I think his, his batting average was insane. It was like, you know, one out of 15 songs ended up, not only ended up on the record, but ended up charting. Yeah. You know, in the billboard. So it's like, <clears throat> you wonder, you know, so here's a guy who can, who, who sat there and did, I love to love you. He's now turning to me and saying, Hey, you know, would you turn the knobs? Would you do this? <laughs> you know? And you start to start to think, well, like, you know, that makes me feel really good that he has yep. confidence in me, you know, to the point where a movie I did with him, uh, Electric Dreams, I ended up writing the majority of the score. I didn't get any credit for it, but, you know, he paid me handsomely for it. Mm -hmm. And you know what it is, is I learned, you know, what's wrong with sitting in a recording studio with, with, that rig that I had told you about with an SSL console and, you know, uh, multi-track digitals in a world-class, you know, scenario and scoring a picture, learning how to like score uh, a first call Hollywood feature film, you know, I mean, that's pretty good, a pretty good way of learning how to do this, you know, and to make a living. <laughs> yeah. Well, that too. <laughs> you know, I, the thing that's really interesting is um, that was an edge for me. Just learning how to use use the systems. I mean, Giorgio uh, was doing a documentary, well, was actually doing a soundtrack for Metropolis at the time. He had made a deal with the German government. Uh, what he would do is he paid for the restoration of uh, Fritz Lang's Metropolis and in exchange for that they licensed him the idea well they gave him a 10-year uh, contract to allow him to put his soundtrack on the silent movie and release it in the mo in movie theaters mm. so um i was involved with that a bit but you know one of the things that was really cool was during that project Giorgio was constantly mixing and wanting to hear it in a professional theater. So they actually put a Magnatech six track, um, you know, uh, 35 millimeter audio recorder in the studio. So they would basically mix a track, transfer it to uh, the six track, and then jump in the car and drive over the hill to the motion picture, uh, to the Hitchcock Theater, and put it up and play it in the theater. So this is, you know, who gets to do that, right? Yeah, really. Who, who gets to learn how to, to, to actually make music for the theater in a scenario where, like, you know, well, we got this deal, so let's take advantage of it, right? So... That's kind of like the seeds of where film, the film writing situation was for me. Um, I, you know, to be honest with you, Ken, it's like, was I gunning for being a film composer? And in the end, not really. I mean, after I did the, the, um, the Breakfast Club, I went and I spent nine months working for Robbie Robertson in the band working on his solo album. And it was really Robbie who, you know, he mentored me. He basically said, hey, you know, you gotta understand that like, this is a publishing business, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, what you really, that's where all the money is. And like Hollywood is kind of a mythological place where famous people work with other famous people and yeah, but no, it's in the end, it's the people who collect royalties are the ones yeah. who don't have to do it anymore, <laughs> you know? And so 
ultimately that's the the interesting thing is like you know there's there's mort in my life and there's Giorgio and there's Robbie and those guys kind of put me in a place where I could, you know, the, the thing is, man, is we're all not the same, right? Mm -hmm. We're all, we're all different. We all have different fascinations. And I knew, you know, I was an, at one point I was an avid tennis player. I'm really interested in food. I'm really interested in cooking, you know, um, I have a family, and so what does it mean? It, at some point in time, uh, well, when I was the busiest, I realized that my kids and my wife saw the back of my head most of the time, you know? So I knew at a certain point in time, I needed to wind that up. I needed to spend more time, give my kids and my- Boy, if that's not speaking the truth. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, the reality is when you're busy, hey, make that money, do it. It's fantastic. Yeah. But at the same time, like how many years does that go by before it gets to be? That's a really old excuse, isn't it? You know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I mean, fundamentally, uh, I'm, you know, where, where my room is at right now is it kind of expresses my own eccentricities about my own curiosities of music and you know i'm a generation that electronic music started and it was mostly tape machines and uh, modular electronic music instruments so that's re reflected in my what i have here although you know i do have a pretty wide array of uh, technology i have different things i instead you know i have a synclavier <laughs> You know, and I have. Can you can we can we dive into that a little bit about how the whole synclavier thing kind of came about? Well, okay. Because um, you still have yours right there, it like pretty much right in front of you. Yes, synclavier okay. is still my central sequencing device. And uh, so, okay, what happened was, and this is really a strange one because, uh, so I worked for two years for Fairlight instruments usa as the product specialist after which i got out and i started doing uh, recording sessions with it and uh well the the fairlight was doing pretty well and i was pretty happy with it i was you know i worked for, for super tramp and uh i worked for a, a lot of people ultimately what happens is in 86, I'm working for, uh, I was working for Giorgio uh, the year before, and now I'm working for Robbie Robertson at the Village Recorder. And uh, in the fall of 86, I get a call, and I'm now working for John Frankenheimer on my first movie for John Frankenheimer, 52 Pickup. And I do two feature films that fall, and uh, I get a call from, of all people, uh, New England Digital, and I'm wondering what the heck is this all about? But they asked me, you know, is there some reason why you're using the Fairlight that you would use the Fairlight other than using the Synclavier? And I said, well, you know, aside from the fact that the Synclavier costs 11 million bucks, no, I mean, that kind of stops the argue, you know, the discussion right there, you know. And I, yeah. I know enough people in Los Angeles who own Fairlights that I can rent the Fairlight, right? I don't have to worry about access to the Fairlight that's available. But the Synclavier is essentially unavailable. So they said, what if we were to make you an offer you couldn't refuse? And I said, well what do you mean is well and they came up with a piece of paper and i said well you know an offer and i thought you know well first let me go to the sinclair office and check this music instrument out and see what whether it's worth it or not right so i went down and it was the sinclair was at the first 
level of its polyphonic sampling system. And what was that instrument? Well, that instrument, uh, well, it's an interesting thing because it's a, an instrument that had an incredible sound to it. And, you know, I, for years, even now, I can play music that the tracks were based from the Sinclair and people are just like those that's really sounds gigantic you know and yeah that it, it had an amazing sound to it and it was 32 voice um it could play 32 notes at the same time and it had 16 outputs so you know when you think about this at one moment you could put elbows on the keyboard and all 32 voices would kind of come out of output one and then the next musical moment all the sounds you could have 16 different sounds and they would all be distributed out to 16 outputs you know pretty amazing you know uh, the reality is the the Sinclair is is a pretty amazing device the the multi-channel section is like an SSL console that's digitally controlled. It's uh, you know all 5532 topology. Um, it's all analog. So this is why this thing sounds so amazing. But the Sinclair, uh, they made me an offer I couldn't refuse, and uh, I ended up buying it. Uh, you know, leasing it. The lease payments were more expensive than my house payments. So I mean. You know, being able to convince my wife that this was a value, you know, useful thing is a conversation all in itself. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is getting back to the conversation that we just had with Just Blaze. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> it's, so one, I mean, it's one of those partnership uh, conversations. The reality of it all is the Sinclair made millions of dollars for me in my career. I mean, it was a really valuable device. And I am so happy I chose it, you know. Um, it was an instrument that was made for someone like me. I spent my entire life um, interested in this stuff. And here's an instrument that was worthy of decades and decades and decades of thought. And well, that's that's what I wanted to get at is you still use it today. What yeah. is it to you that stands out about the Sinclair that makes it like you didn't get tired of it? You stayed with it. You know, you, you other things have come and gone and you could have jumped ship and, and kind of just forgotten about it. But you didn't. You, you stuck with it. Well, there's certain things like. Um, it was the first. Uh, oh, that's that's a good question. Well, let me think about that. That's interesting. Um, well, first of all, the build quality mm -hmm. instrument did not fall apart, you know, yeah. and uh, it actually worked for for generations, and it was it still is relatively uh, easy to fix mm -hmm. compared to. The Jupiter 8, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, that's one thing. Two, it actually had a musical depth to it that when, you know, you learn certain things, um, it has, a, a, like other music, computer music instruments, it has intelligence built in, but the angle of how the intelligence was implemented is a little different mm -hmm. for instance it has a 200 track sequencer right um if you basically wanted to and i don't know why anyone would want to you could hit record and you could play clusters on each of the 200 tracks and they would still play back in perfect time okay Try doing that with logic or anything else, and you see like how, you know, after a certain amount of polyphony, all the CC, you know, when things happen and everything, 
is constantly dynamic and is constantly moving because uh, it's trying to do everything all at once with one mind, you know? And mm -hmm. um, the Sinclair is much more designed like, you know, an Apollo space capsule <laughs> where the sampler is the module and, you know, each thing is modular and has its own set of hardware. So it's much more difficult to overload it. Okay. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's the funny thing. It's sort of like, so now we have computers that can do millions of things at, at once, but you have really only one conduit to tell it what to do. So, I mean, that's the interesting thing. The Sinclair has been consistent through most of its life for me. Um, and you still, you still find today that um, that's something that the workflow of it is something that you, you find inspiring and, and want to go to? Uh, absolutely. I mean, the, the second thing, I mean, the most important thing is the sound. You know, maybe it's a good thing. Why don't you play, uh, why don't you play the Under Siege Q I sent you? And that was, is that the U.S. or is that the Forgotten? It's the U.S. Yeah, okay. So and let, me, let the, me set that up right now. And what this is, is this is the Sinclair and guitar. There it is right there. of this well these are samples so it's like there's a, a big mode shift that's being played on a couple octaves um the principal uh percussion instrument is a gatum which is a, a sample of a gatum which is a, a large clay pot that's got copper shavings in it that the player plays with his fingers, right? Um, but all of this is all of this is all uh, single. It's it's a hundred percent single. Except for the there's a guitar, little guitar effects here and there. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's pretty incredible that it's all on this piece that's, God, what? I mean, close to 40 years old, right? 30 years old. So, yeah, I mean, I mean that's, that's pretty incredible right there. And you went on to use uh, this to score, I mean, so many different, soundtracks you, you as you said you did uh breakfast club um was that kind of like the breakout one for you uh the breakfast club i don't have the front credit on it so but what it did was it's an interesting thing because the breakfast club generated uh what, what's the word the words credibility right mm -hmm. and uh um but it was through, you know, Robbie, Robbie, Robert, when I was working for Robbie Robertson, um, Gary Gersh was his producer on his first solo album. And, uh, you know, Gary goes on to become the president of Capitol Records, ultimately, later that year. But um, Gary's brother is Brian Gersh. And Brian at the time was working at an um, agency called Triad. And he represented, you know, Michael Honig and Tangerine Dream, a bunch of electronic music people. Mm -hmm. So I, I asked Gary, would you please introduce me to this guy? I'd love to meet him, you know, because I had done the Breakfast Club. This was a way of 
introduction, I can get in, right? So I basically, uh, Gary sets up an introduction and I meet him. I meet Brian and, you know, he hears my, listens to my demo tape and he goes, okay, it's cool and everything, but I don't have any space. I don't, I'm not adding any new artists right now, um, but I'll keep you in mind. So he throws the cassette in his desk and uh, we shake hands and that's it. Um, a few months later, um, I'm on this, you know, at the village and we're starting to track uh, with Daniel Lanois the first uh, tracks of Robbie's solo album when, when Brian calls and says, Gary, you got a pencil? Write this address down. I write the address down. He says, can you go there now? Well, you know, I'm in the middle of a session. He says, okay, well, how about an hour? You know, so we took during lunch break, I get in the car. And I drive to this address in, in, in uh, the ballroom there. There's Roy Scheider, um, Ann Margaret, Vanity, and John Frankenheimer. And uh, they asked me to do this movie, 52 Pickup. And really, you know, that's the interesting thing. So that's basically uh, from The Breakfast Club, I didn't really get much uh, momentum, but it was really 52 Pickup that started mm -hmm. my career as a film composer. Later on, you started getting known for doing some of the uh, the martial arts films of, uh, I guess it would have been the late 80s, early 90s. Um, those were just on a personal level, like that stuff was like the soundtrack to my youth, you know, like Perfect <laughs> Weapon and, you know, the, the, these movies were just iconic to me. Um, what was it about those movies that, really kind of um stood out to you when you were when you were working on those um well it it shows you a uh, a really dramatic contrast between yesterday and today you know like uh we talked about this yesterday how the average um film score is like hundreds of tracks now and um, ultimately, those martial arts movies, you know, including Under Siege, I mean, when we were doing the final mix, there's barely 20 tracks. There are so few tracks, it's, it's crazy. So what does it mean? It means the sounds are bigger, you know? Uh, you know, anyone who, who, who has mixed stuff realizes like, you know, anytime you go even 48 tracks, you have to really size down in order to get, you know, the, everything to fit. So I think it's really interesting that, uh, you know, tracks like uh, Under Siege or, uh, you know, Death Warrant or uh, The Perfect Weapon, they have really large sounding soundtracks. And it's because we as composers, what we had is we had a 24 track tape recorder and something like a synclavier, and mm -hmm. that was the that was the sound source for the entire soundtrack. Tell me, so I I had to ask you this before, but you got to tell me some of the some of the titles to some songs that you've done have been pretty silly. Uh, can, can you tell me what was it called again? It's, it's like I've got a large pee pee. Well, you know. First of all, like the, most of that stuff is not for public uh, eyes, you know? Uh huh. That's just Q sheet. Those are Q sheet titles. So, you know, it's true. If ultimately, when they're, uh, when they're basically, they come out of soundtracks, they list them that way. And it's like, and you're like, oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe I would have, if I had known this was going to happen, maybe I would have reconsidered. <laughs> what the title was but that's hilarious i i actually had something similar to that happen to me when i was working on a sound design project i had done a bunch of presets and um, i was asked to provide a spreadsheet with all my modulation 
and um, you know, for each patch, like provide what modulation was used and, you know, and give it a title and then give it descriptions. Right. And it's right. like, well, when we're talking about synthesizer descriptions, it's like, it can get pretty esoteric pretty quick. Right. Yeah. So um, I didn't, I thought that this was all just for internal usage. Right. Like I was never told marketing department would have a hold of this, anything like that. Right. So you know, as I'm describing things, I'm getting further in depth into like, oh, this is the angel, angels rocking on the edge of hell. Just <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like typing stuff out because I knew that all the other sound designers were just typing like, oh, it's a warm bass sound, blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, I'm like, you've, you've taken too much acid and you're on the verge of going insane. <laughs> and I'm writing these things out just to mess with the rest of the team's head, you know? And, uh, and then, Come to find out later on, it's like plastered on their website. It, and yeah, you can go there, and I believe it's still up there today. So you can go and you can look at each sound designer's presets, and then it has a description of their preset. And That's as you get true. deeper into mine, it, they start getting weirder and weirder. <laughs> it's back in the uh, boy, but you know, back in the days when the first laptops came out, you know. Um, I brought my laptop to the uh, spotting session for, you know, for my um, music editor to use. And she just really laughed because she said, you know, she discovered on my desktop, I had a folder that was named fucker. <laughs> and she just went like, who, who makes a folder name? <laughs> <You know? laughs> But that's the thing is like at a certain point, I've been, you know, by the not by uh, the 80s, I had been involved with, uh, you know, computers for almost 20 years, you know, and uh, it was so my familiarity and my relationship with computers was totally different than most people. You were comfortable. <laughs> well, I would, yeah, enough to curse it. My computer <laughs> as often as I felt like, you know, but that's the, the, the reality is everyone ends up having a relationship with their computer as they're, as they work. And I guess that's the thing about the Sinclair for me, incidentally, is that the Sinclair warmed up and it's an instrument that warms up to me the more I play it. Right. As opposed to it being a computer, the universal tool that is every six months I have to update it and some new features change or the UI is changed, you know, instead, here's the thing that like, like the piano, I can actually just sit here and it does what it does. And I don't have to think twice about it, you know? And I'll show, uh, I'll show this real quick. This is... So it, it lives on YouTube. <laughs> now, did you enjoy the um, the aspect of going from from genre to genre and and you know changing things up for for these film scores? Well, you know, honestly, it was kind of a pain in the ass, but. Incidentally, that's all Sinclair too. That's Sinclair with a live overdub of gu guitar and a, bra a horn section. That's Man. it. So the it just kind of was the bed for everything, huh? Yeah. Well, that's the thing that it, it was versatile. And uh, so it, it meant I got better at, at this instrument, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, yeah, I, it, it's funny, like, being versatile was, ended up being, you know, my shortcoming, right? I should have just stayed in one genre, and I probably would have had a longer career. But at the same time, I wouldn't have worked with as many brilliant filmmakers as I got to do, you know? You so. you think that you think that the versatility more would have held you back than... than sticking to one genre if i stayed in action or stayed in horror or whatever it would, oh, have, I gotcha. would have been different 
but I got to work with John Hughes and I got to work with John Frankenheimer and, uh, you know, really uh, a large variety, Jan Eagleson, Craig Baxley. Uh, I mean, that's the interesting thing about all of our, uh, all of our careers is like, I don't think anyone, any of those directors really like either other each other's work <laughs> but i worked on them <laughs> so after after having done all of this right having a, a long spanning career you still have a room completely filled with synthesizers and gear what is it now that still inspires you what what is the stuff that gets you excited to to still want to one spend money on gear and two um use it spend the time to use it well i you know, I've, I've become kind of like an Emily Dickinson type of artist here because I don't really, I don't know if it matters to me that the public hears my music from now on, you know? Um, and people ask, do you miss the film industry? And the reality is, no, I don't, you know? Um, I have always, you know, been interested in a kind of music that has not really been very commercial or popular. And, uh, um, you know, I'm continuing to make that music. So um, I sent you along some samples of various yeah, I'll, things. I wanted to grab that. Um, the first one, I actually, I, well, well, we'll go to this one first. So we're going to go to the forgotten one, right? Okay. All right. So, so we're going to. You go ahead and explain it as it goes. So here's a piece of music that was written in 1978. And it was a live performance piece. And it was written for the Surge Modular system. Oh, this copy, this performance I did in 2018 on uh, the new Eurorack version of the Surge. All right, now let me let me turn this up a bit. Oh, and I turned it all the way down. <laughs> Say that one more time. It's supposed to be quiet. It's an ambient yeah. piece. It's Also going to be bringing up. Here it is. Now you have Big Sky on here. Should I play this one as well? Sure. We're going to bring this in. I'm not sure if this is going to. You should probably just yeah. Here we go. Now, are you using a Big Sky Reverb here? No. No? Okay. Worth asking.
Now, do you have these up on like a SoundCloud or anything for people so that I can link to them? No. <laughs> I'm going to pause this. Um, so this this is primarily like ambient music that you're making here. Um, is that kind of where your mind's been at lately? It's, you know, I've always made this kind of music. It's just that, uh, you know, that's why you can well imagine. It's sort of like I'm making this kind of music and then someone says, hey, uh, can I pay you $11 million to drop what you're doing and do this other thing for me. You know, yeah. Okay. So I drop everything and go do that. And it was like, that can take six weeks to three months. Then, okay. I'll get, now that that's all done, let's get back to doing what I'm doing. And like, I get back into it just in time for the phone to ring again to say, Hey, can you just drop everything and I'll pay you $11 million to go do this other thing, you know? <laughs> so that's the funny thing is like, no, I'm much more interested in doing this ambient thing. Yeah. I always have since I was uh, 25, you know? So but I have, I have one other cue I want to play real quick and that's the, uh, the spectral one. Um, okay. and I'm going to, I'm going to kind of segue into this one, uh, because we're going to talk about the modern gear, uh, like the stuff that's more cutting edge, more new that, that you're using. So okay. let me uh, let me roll this in a little bit here. Well, you should. I should tell you. The, here, I'll pause it. Yeah. Yeah. This is, uh, you know, one of the things that I've been doing is I'm doing some consulting for and uh, beta testing and various things for manufacturers. And one of the interesting modules that came out recently is Paul Schreiber's of Synthetech E520 processor. And the algorithm I'm most inter interested in is the uh, spectral drone algorithm. And uh, so here's a sample of something that I've been doing, trying to make uh, with this module and this algorithm. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna say I have I have one of those modules here as well, um, and I, I tend to use a lot of like the the pitch shifting and stuff on it because that that stuff is always I always find pitch shifting in general is like a really quirky like you know how when when you're playing with an analog synth a lot of the times like you want to explore how it saturates on the filter and mm -hmm. you want to hear how the resonance breaks up and gets dissonant with the oscillator tone and that sort of thing. For me, digital stuff I tend to really dig into is how sound breaks up when you stretch it too far and that sort of thing. But with that particular module, it's like you can go so crazy far with it um, that things just get really, really strange um, when, when you get way out of typical <laughs> with it, you know, and then you throw a reverb on that and it, it's just, wacky uh, i actually haven't even messed with the um convolution on it yet um that stuff's just been added but uh what are, what are some of the pieces that you're using that are really um like that you're finding like uh just a joy to explore um 
you know, it's interesting because it depends, you know, my use of modular is a little different than others because I tend to use the uh, wired as kind of a development system, uh, generating patches that ultimately I'll replicate in uh, Eurorack. But for instance, uh, this system now has a lot of MIDI to CV conversion now. I have uh, four poly end, um, poly two converters. Part of it is because I've been experimenting with polyphony in modular. So uh, in this particular case, what I have is I have four Tone Star, uh, Studio Electronics Tone Star modules, and uh, they are basically being controlled by a poly and poly two, and they ultimately are kind of a modular four voice polyphonic. Um, I'm awaiting right now from Paul uh, an E370 quad. Uh, digital oscillator that has cloud and you know uh, yeah that thing's pretty that thing's pretty insane that i'll add as a four as a second oscillator to the each tone star module to give me the tone star setup that you have takes up a lot of space but you get a lot of a lot for that space um you know getting a four voice synth essentially out of those blocks is pretty awesome but then when you add in things like the E370, which is a large module of itself, you know, and the E520 large module of itself also. It's like you start you start filling up those racks pretty quick. Well, it's true. But, you know, here's the thing that's interesting is what is, what's the implication of a, a polyphonic modular device? One of the things that if you didn't have a polyphonic synthesizer ever, you, you would never uh, enjoy sequencing through it you sequence a pattern with a polyphonic instrument you can lengthen the releases yeah much more dynamically uh natural acoustic sounding patterns right as opposed to running through a monophonic instrument where it's just you exactly. instead now you have much more so the modular generates that same implication. I can generate a four voice. And, you know, after having large scale polyphonic instruments like the wave, you start to realize that, you know, four voices is pretty good. I can run, I can do a uh, pattern through it and lengthen uh, the releases to give me an, a natural decay. Um, and it gives me, you know, the, the cool thing is because there are only four synths, it's relatively controllable. I mean, like the uh, to be able to generate a sound that kind of sounds like the same instrument, you know. And then, you know, in this system, I'm not using one E520. I'm using two E520s. Mm -hmm. So the and. Uh, Ultimately, the back end filter on this is a pair of Shipman um, VCF1, VCF2 pairs, the two filters that uh, Karsten had created for his original Ebon Flute module. I had lo I love the Ebon Flute module, except the only thing it was is it was mono. So when his uh, he decided to make Eurorack modules out of those filters. I bought them and I have a stereo pair of them now. So um, a lot of the design in my room comes back to the, the 80s. It's like going from the Jupiter. What was cool about the Jupiter 8? It had stack mode. You can hit stack and you get a four voice synth on top of a four voice synth. So you could either use the same program and thicken it up, or you could use two different programs for color. Um, so what was the evolution of that? Oh, you buy two Super Jupiters, and instead of stacking them, you go mono, mono left and right. 
you know, and you can stack the sounds that way. So you had, but it was eight voices, mm -hmm. right? Um, I have a Prophet 10 pair that I do exactly the same thing. It's basically going through a MIDI merger. The MIDI merger has MIDI out, and MIDI through, going to the desktop. So every knob that I turn on the keyboard basically yeah. also modifies the desktop. So you're using a Prophet 20? Yeah, well, yes, but it's actually a Prophet 10 stereo. Yeah, right? yeah. So a lot of the concepts I have in, in uh, modular have to do in extending that concept into bigger, bigger sounds. Well, you're and, talking about doing that stereo like that. Are you, are you using the tone stars and sending left and right with that or? They go, they, they are all mixed in a, a four, four MS VCA matrix. So I can actually send it out in quad if I care to. And you have in your studio, you've got, you know, a surround sound set up in there. Yes, I do. It's a 5.1. 5.2 setup, two and subs you, and five satellites. And you find that, so when you're when you're mixing your ambient works, are you doing most of that in surround sound? I, I guess I am. That makes me a little bit jealous. <laughs> you know, it's, that's the thing is like, you know, it's California in the seventies, California in the seventies was, hey, we have quad records, everything. So what are we doing? We're making a whole bunch of multi-channel ambient electronic music and then you know the year they ended quad they discontinued quad well that was such a tragedy so many pieces of music just ended up in the closet never to be played again you know i think doing um 5.1 mixes of modular is kind of um that's an, that it's an ambitious thing it's, it's you know, and when you're using a modular, you could certainly like see the the appeal to it. You know, for sure, especially sending things from front to back as opposed to just left and right. I mean, right. that that's really um, things can get interesting. But when you're doing ambient works, especially, it's like you start getting the hair tingling on the back of your neck kind of thing with with uh, you know, especially with like you know, like you said, the the spectral drone and and that sort of thing where you're getting like these interesting sheen that can kind of come across your music. Do you find um, with doing the ambient works, do you find that you need to really rein in things like reverb and, and kind of uh, not wash it out too much? Because I find that a lot of people when they're doing ambient works really will gravitate to a reverb and then it's like, well, now everything has reverb. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting because uh, I got, you know, um, I got hooked on multi-channel music back in the 70s when I was a student, but I really kind of got more uh, insight on how to use it uh, as a what, mixing film scores, because here we are. At first we had the Matrix, and the Matrix, ironically, was a two to five, you know, two to three, it was actually two to four channel, um, decoder that Dolby used for surround sound. Okay. And uh, I still have one of those boxes, but that's a simple thing was what's in the left only is in the left. What's in the right only is in the right. What's in the left and right simultaneously is in the center. And what's yeah. out of what's out of phase in the left and right is in the surround. Right. So you could mix that way. And, you know, you can well imagine that if this whole 80s thing, incidentally, you listen to Beverly Hills Cop or something like that, and you see here um, the synthesizers bouncing all over the place. It's because of that eight voice left and right thing, right? We're going to take the same patch and we're going to put it all on the left and all on the right, but they're two different synthesizers playing in unison. But they're they're not perfectly in tune, so their phase relationship goes back and forth and sends stuff to the back and to the center, right? And uh, so that was an initial thing. But as soon as we got into Dolby Digital and uh, Discrete 5.1, 
the thing that hits you is, well, first of all, like all the all the reverbs that we've had up to this point, include you know, and I have to say, in modular, have been kind of the stereo profile. What is that? It's a uh, well, you know, in the '80s, um, a reverb came out called the Quantac, and it might have been the most accurate reverb at that time. It was amazing. But what was the problem with it? The problem with it is it sounded too natural. And you know, and what was in vogue at the time was the RMX16, the uh, AMS, which sounded very unnatural. Well, what was the difference? The difference was in stereo mixing, re reverb is behind the speakers, mm -hmm. right? The kick is that is where the at the level in the presence of the speaker, the reverb's behind the speaker. So, and it's quieter. It's a good 15 dB quieter than the kick drum, right? So mm -hmm. it has to be opaque or else you can't hear it. And that was the problem with the Quantec is it was too perfect. You had to play it really loud in order for you, for you to hear it. Now in surround sound though, the phenomena is the reverb is not behind the speakers. Nothing is behind the speakers. Everything is inside the perimeter mm -hmm. of the speakers. So what it, what it means is that that opaque kind of stereo reverb sounds dirty and sounds noisy. And you're sitting in a space that just sounds filthy, you know? Mm -hmm. And so the evolution of like the TC system 6000 or the most current, ver you know, uh, uh, Eventide H9000, these are reverbs that sound pristine and the music can exist inside the reverb without everything just sounding like, you know, it needs to take a bath, you know, or it is taking a bath. <laughs> it's too wet. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Uh, the, the things that, that I'm, I'm just seeing in the setup right now, when, when I look at what you're using, you know, a lot of this stuff is, is interesting to me because you don't seem to be somebody who's um, flying with, with the trend, but at the same time, you've got a lot of new stuff and you've got stuff that you've held on to forever, you know? Um, so, so I, I just find that really fascinating that like, for instance, you've got that beautiful blue wired system behind you that it's like, you can't ignore that. You've got a Macbeth right next to you. And then you have an essence FM behind that, you know, underneath of those. And it's like the juxtaposition there is, is pretty interesting. You know, you've got stuff that's, you know, kind of classic and not, not as well known. And then you've got new ultra boutique, you know, in, in the Macbeth. And then you've got something new that's, you know, kind of interesting and quirky digital in the essence FM. Um, do you find that pairing all those things together, uh, do you find that you can blend them together well and make them all sit in the mix together nicely? Or do you find that you gravitate towards like a certain block of, of gear to keep things sounding, you know, correct in a mix together? You know, it's interesting because, you know, what's funny is like, I remember Sabotnik saying this is back when he, he was the chairman I think in 1978, he was the chairman of uh, the electronic music section of the AES convention. And uh, his opening statements, one of the last things he said is, you know, well, I hope these synthesizers uh, become instruments at some point and not just remain these kind of clinical, you know, uh, lab mm -hmm. lab rats so to speak you know and that's the thing that's interesting is i have been doing this for you know 40 some years now and i have my favorite sounding instruments there's just no doubt about that i still use a couple of samples that i you know i used when i had the fairlight mm -hmm. i still have them here in my studio um, why do I have the, the, the FM? It's because, you know, I have sounds that I've made 
that I think are valid and musical and beautiful that, uh, you know, I continue to use them. And uh, um, that's the interesting thing to me is that uh, I'm trying to not have very many old things. I mean, I have new old things, right? I have like, uh, let's see if I can turn near. There's a two voice pro here, right? And there's a, there's a prophet and there, there are some older things in here, but in the end, um, I don't, I don't want to have those relationships with vintage instruments anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, to be really honest with you, it's like, they're wonderful. Do they sound any better than these new reissues? And I would argue the two voice pro, this two voice pro sounds better than the old two voice pro. Why? Well, because first of all, it has a MIDI keyboard. So it's already prop, you know, it will do what I need to do in my studio immediately without any modifications or any, any craziness. If right? only there were more of those out there. <laughs> oh, I mean, you know, God bless Tom. Yeah. He, he is, a, he's brilliant and kind and amazing person for our community for sure. And, uh, um, I have, uh, a pair of Deckard's dreams, mm -hmm. you know, eight voice, left eight voices right you know and there's something what so what's so good about that oh well you know on some patches you're running six lfos per note <laughs> you know uh, so um i like the i you know so there's my cs80 right i have a, an old midi board here because it has polyphonic aftertouch so i can do that cs80 thing if i want to so in a lot of ways, what sits in my room, you know, is the essence of Gary over the decades of yeah. my time with electronic music, you know, and I've tried to update, like, you know, what's the difference between the, the, the essence FM and buying a DX5? Well, Usability what? for one. How about 250 voices? I mean, yeah. there's 300 voices in the instrument. So, I mean, that's the interesting thing is God bless new processors, new. Yeah, yeah, really. New technology. So, like, you know, suddenly we can do all that stuff. And, you know, it's like the E520 is, you know, Paul is taking a newer processor and, and you know, converting those the elisis things uh, yeah. reverbs to the new processor is it's not child's play it took them a bit of time to do it and it took skill to do it and eric and paul are amazing mm -hmm. at that uh, but at the same time it generates a much more stable environment for those same algorithms and uh and it, it generates some interesting extra features as well yeah yeah, I need to I need to start messing with that. I've been a bit busy with other projects, but I'm I'm anxious to get back to that. I've got I've got a black face plate one right there. So I'm I'm anxious to get to that uh once uh once Knobcon is is kind of past. That's that's the current crunch. <laughs> yes. So uh but listen, it's been wonderful having you on and um I hope to be able to talk to you again soon. Uh Thank you so, so much for coming on. And uh, I know I speak for everybody who's been watching that uh, this has been a joy to, to hear these stories and and find out a little bit about this. So and honestly, <laughs> I could ask you questions for the next five years and, and we wouldn't get to, to to a tip of it, you know. Well, thanks for having me, Ken. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And thank everybody in the in the chat for uh, for coming and watching. And uh, yeah, I'll have a. Um, I'm going to be, I haven't done the, the Synth Summit show in a while. I, I know that you've seen some of the other ones that I had done. Um, and I had Paul, we were just talking about Paul. I've had him on before. Uh, I'm sure I'll have him on again as well, because he, he's another guy that's got stories for days. But uh, uh, yeah, I think um, the next show is going to be very soon. And I'm saying this now so that I can make it happen. So that even if I'm busy, I, I make it happen. Um, the next show will be... Um, I'm going to have Marco on from 
Rossum, Electro Mew. Awesome. Uh, but what's going to be interesting, I've had him on, uh, Marco Alpert, I've had him on from uh, along with Dave before, but this one's going to be interesting because I'm only going to have Marco on, and I'm going to talk about his time with Akai and um, working on the MPC 2000 project and and how that stuff all all went about because I feel like that's a really interesting story that kind of deserves its own topic. So I'm going to dig into that with the next show. Absolutely, that's a great. Right. Well, thank you again. You're welcome. Yep. Take care. Have a good one. All right. Bye-bye.